So hello everyone and welcome to printmaking and LGBTQIA plus communities, whether you're joining us here at PMC or online. I'm Anthony Tino, I use he, they pronouns, and I'm the network's administrator at Paul Mellon Center, where I work on the British Art Network, the Doctoral Research Network, and Early Career Research Network. Um, not to plug the network's department too much, but um, if you're interested in learning more about joining, um, you can find me after tonight's talk and I can tell you a bit more about uh, what membership looks like and what the networks can offer. Um, but I'm excited to be chairing tonight's talk by Zorian. Um, and before I introduce Zorian, I'd like to introduce the series as a whole. Um, so Printmaking for Change, Past and Present, has offered a really interesting program, um, this time um, with public lectures and more uh, experiential learning moments, um, which has included some visits to print shops such as Page Masters. Um, it's referred to as a festival of free events, uh, exploring how different communities have used and continues to use printmaking to enact change, share knowledge, and challenge ideas. Uh, with talks, workshops, and behind the scenes visits, the two week festival exploring the potential of printmaking as both a means of mass communication and radical art form. From the 15th century to present day, the program covers a broad range of topics from gender, sexuality, and race to politics, activism, and health. Talks and workshops have been taking place at PMC, the British Museum, Page Masters, and Royal College of Physicians. Um, so about tonight's event, this evening we will be exploring LGBTQIA plus liberty and visibility through the varied history of printmaking via 17th century radicals, 18th century flamboyance, and 19th century scandal to contemporary understandings around diverse gender and sexuality, prints, and ephemera. Zorian will provide a unique snapshot into a rich and radical history. Through looking at portraits and zines, celebrating pioneer activists, writers, and artists, as well as highlighting significant queer spaces in Britain through the centuries, this session will provide an overview of the considerable contribution to printmaking made by the LGBTQIA community and its many ancestors. So the learning team at PMC graciously invited me to chair tonight's lecture, given my own background in printmaking. Um, artist book publishing and working with print media more broadly. Um, to give you all a brief background of my professional history, um, I earned a bachelor's degree in printmaking in 2012 um, at the State University of New York at New Paltz, um, where I was sort of intensely creating etchings and litho and silkscreen, um, after which I started Endless Editions, which is a Rezo workshop in New York that's still in operation to this day and is associated with the uh, Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop. Um, from 2016 to 18, I worked at Griffin Editions in Brooklyn um, and also established an art book fair in Dubai called Fully Booked, which was also an artist book uh, platform and distributor for works uh, by artists from North Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. Uh, more recently, in 2022, I co-curated an exhibition at New York Center for Book Arts um, and produced an exhibition at the Others Art Fair in Torino last year. Um, some upcoming personal work um, is working with uh, an artist called Ambrosia, whose work will be featured in a publication, uh, publication called Arte Queer uh, by Rizzoli Publishers, uh, which will be the first survey uh, publication to index the history of queer art in Italy. Um, so before introducing Zorian, just wanted to take a moment to mention that there may be a few instances in the presentation where artists have used language originally designed to be derogatory, which these artists have reclaimed in a way that is related to their own empowerment or activism. So I just wanted to make sure that this was addressed because we understand that people with lived experiences may be sensitive to such language, and we just want to be sure that we're being sensitive to our audience in the room and online. So Zorian Clayton is a curator of prints at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, specializing in poster, paper, ephemera, and queer art history. 
He's been the co-chair of the LGBTQ work group of the VNA for the past nine years. Um, recent publications including contributions to the poster, A Visual History by Thames and Hudson, 2020, Museum Sec Sexuality and Gender Activism by Rutledge, 2020, and Fashioning Masculinities, the Art of Menswear, for which he is also a curatorial advisor. Since 2016, he's worked jointly as a programmer for the British Film Institute's Flair Festival and as a board member of Trans Creative, a Manchester-based arts company platforming transgender and non-binary writers, artists, directors, and performers. So I will hand it over to Zorian. And hello, everybody at home. Many thanks uh, for joining me in this 45-minute odyssey through the history of LGBTQ interest printmaking, at the end of which we're going to have a bit more of a QA and a and a discussion and a mingly drink for those of you in the building. And for those on the camera over there, we will mingle with you in spirit. Uh, but we'll be covering a really wide range of artists, and some of them will certainly be familiar to you, but hopefully many of them will also, some of them will be new. Um, all of them I selected for having made a significant contribution to printmaking specifically, even if they might be better known for working in another medium in some cases. And I try to fit in as many forms of printmaking from all sorts of printed ephemera, like pamphlets and zines and posters and book plates, of which this is a, a part, um, to a wide range of artists who've centered printmaking in their practice quite significantly and covering the widest time uh, period as I could, as, as far as my knowledge allows. Um, and printmaking types of us, so including some screen prints, intaglio varieties. Um, people are doing very interesting things now with intaglio in tetra packs. So have a go at that. So there's all for all of the complicated ways that you can do these processes where you need a studio and lots of equipment. There's always a DIY way where you can hack it and do it with sort of stuff you find out of the bin. So also including relief prints, wood cuts, lino cuts, planographic prints, which is printing from a flat surface, uh, mainly lithography done on huge heavy stones. I had to move one this week. It was about half the size of this screen. It took 20 hours uh, to move it with 10 people. Um, it's going on display in the London Transport Museum. I have a new show about posters that opens next week. So go and have a look at it. It took uh, a huge amount to get it in there. Um, so yeah, I think the versatility is what's so appealing to me about the world of print and the range of tones and textures that can be achieved with it, I think really outstrips all the other art forms in my view, but it's not a competition. Um, I don't want to let, you know, yeah, don't let the complexity of some of the processes kind of put you off um, because, come on in, uh, because yeah, there's always, um, a very uh, a cheaper way to do it. And another thing that's uh, very key that I will mention as we go through is the fantastic collaborative nature of it. Um, it can take many hands, especially to make very large scale works. Some large print studios might have 10 master print makers who are working with an artist. So we were just talking about print studios before when I got to visit Two Palms, which is a very fancy one in New York last year. Chris Afili was working there and they had about 15 uh, master printmakers who were just executing his ideas, you know. So it's this very amazing collaborative process and there's nothing really like it. So my selection is simply that. Another speaker might have chosen something very different, uh, but 45 minutes obviously isn't very long to cover everything. Um, but we're gonna kick off with a very famous uh, printmaker, of course, and a master who a lot of people believe has never been surpassed. This is Dura. Uh, this is a, a woodcut of 1496 called The Bathhouse. This is a little detail um, as well. Uh, one of the greatest printmakers of all time. Uh, his ability to control texture and depth and light and really pack the detail into a block or plate um, is, is really quite extraordinary. And the sort of cheeky detail zooms in on the person who is sort of the most suggestive figure, um, and it's a self-portrait of the artist. It's considered to be Dura himself. Um, lots of bawdy clues were very much all the rage in Renaissance symbolism, especially things like seeded fruits and frothing cups and jugs that have been knocked over. But this placement of the tap is really quite bold for the time. And there's a definitely cruisy feel about this bathhouse scene. All of the other people in it are 
supposedly his friends, people that he knew, and the drinking man uh, on the right uh, is uh, one of his very good friends. He was called Willibald Perkheimer, and between Dürer and Willibald were a couple of quite tantalizing letters, references about them finding Italian soldiers attractive, and one inscription on a portrait of Perkheimer by Dürer, which is inscribed in Greek um, with sexual references between men. Um, so hand printing, of course, had been around for millennia, um, considered to have been invented in China alongside paper making, but it was the invention of the printing press in 1440, which, well, roughly around 1440, which greatly revolutionized things in Europe, allowing phenomenal amounts of art like this to be really mass produced and circulated for the first time. And Dürer was one of the first artists to really make an enormous impact with his mastery of printing. And so much so that there was this group called the Kleinermeisters, who were the little masters, who uh, were a group of engravers basically just working to, to try and emulate his style, but none of them quite uh, come close. Um, so we, this, this is from 1620. Uh, and this sort of hotbed of self-published printed political pamphlets, which were all the rage. If you had an opinion, you could publish it in little texts or illustrated booklets like this. And a few examples, several examples have survived uh, from the 17th century, which relate to gender nonconformity and so-called deviant sexualities. So one of the best known illustrated examples is this Hick Mulia uh, on the left, um, or the man-woman, uh, which railed against women opting for masculine fashions. And they were ex especially upset about, I quote, the wearing of broad-brimmed hats, pointed doublets, and hair cut short or shorn. Um, the title combines a Latin male personal pronoun with the noun for woman. And the pamphlet on the right was the response pamphlet that came out. So it's called Hec Vir, uh, which also came out in 1620 and combines the Latin female personal pronoun with the noun for a man. Um, but the response hits back at various points on the more feminine styles of dress and comportment which were seen to be worn by men at the time. Uh, both of them are anonymous, so we don't, you know, we don't know who the authors are. Um, one of the more, uh, a lot of these have been digitized. You can find them online. Um, one, uh, which was published in 1749, was entitled Satan's Harvest Home. Uh, it blamed opera for taking men away from their noble warlike moods. And they talked about how paint was very much in vogue with gentlemen, as with the ladies in France. Uh, can there be any more shocking than to see a couple of creatures who wear the shapes of men, which I thought was an interesting way to put it, uh, kiss each other in public places? This is a public pamphlets that were distributed in the street um, in, you know, in 1749. So many of these pamphlets actually give quite a lot of information about cruising grounds as well. So even though they have a homophobic intent, they're actually giving a lot of information about the language that people would use for pickups and where you might go. So Lincoln's Inn, Royal Exchange, Covent Garden, very close to here, um, are all sort of named. And the location of Molly houses where you could go. So they definitely had this kind of dual purpose. Um, Another type of uh, cheap and small uh, mass-produced type of print that would have had a very wide range and reach at the time is the humble playing card. Um, sets of playing cards depicting historical events were very popular in the last quarter of the 17th century especially. And this example is from 1679, and it links to a gay interest narrative. Um, Titus Oates has been described as a radical homosexual Anglican parson, I like that, uh, and legend has it he was also very prone to exaggeration. He was involved in a lot of fraudulent uh, dealings, and he was expelled from the Navy of all places for being gay, for, for, for homosexual acts. Um, he was a chaplain in the, in the Navy. Um, but these playing cards illustrate the Popish plot, um, which in short was a conspiracy to kill uh, Charles II and restore Catholicism as the dominant religion uh, in this country. And Titus Oates uh, claimed to have uncovered this plot um, personally. But his story and his portraits are very widely printed and Often, you know, they were besmirching his name as a general traitor and things, but they, there were also lots and lots 
of discussion about him as a, as a homosexual man in the late uh, 17th century. And just to sort of jump into a way that, oh, no, it's missed a slide. Oh, well, I was going to show you a slide of, uh, maybe I put it in later. And Yeah, I did. I just bought some cards, which are Catherine Opie's Dyke Deck, uh, which are from 1995, that's sort of 52 lesbians. So we're carrying on with the cards and they're going into the, um, into the collection. So I'm very glad to get 52 lesbians into the collection in one go with uh, the next thing. Um, so one of the best known life stories of the 18th century, which continues to interest many people today. And I think it's really, I can't believe no one's made a fantastic film about them yet. I think there's like a dodgy TV movie, but the Chevalier Dion, who I'm sure um, might have been uh, familiar to you, um, was a French secret agent, a soldier, and a very famous fencer from whom the term eonism is derived, which isn't really a word particularly used uh, today, but it denoted specifically male to female transvesticism or transition. And through a huge amount of printed portraits, they were one of the greatest celebrities of a particular moment in the 18th century. They were held in very high esteem by early feminists, um, including Mary Robinson and Mary Wollstonecroft. Um, they were fired, uh, in short, from their job and ordered to return to France, but they refused to go. And instead, they uh, aired lots of uh, diplomatic secrets in libelous and scandalous publications in the 1760s. And so then they were forced into exile. They remained in London, and there'd always been this question about their gender. Um, but... Uh, Basically, as part of their agreement, part of their exile, they were um, they signed an agreement to be publicly recognised as a woman by the King of France, and they lived out the remainder of their life in London as a woman. Uh, they died in 1810, and they're interred at St Pancras Old Church. So their grave has become rather a sort of a, a pilgrimage for lots of um, trans people. And um, this is a, a poster that's made quite recently by Fox Fisher, who's quite a well-known uh, documentary maker, non-binary artist, um, who has a, a very good, well, it's a YouTube channel, I think it's called My Generation, and they make a lot of trans and non-binary interest films, but they, this is just like an example of a sort of cheap printed poster that's mass produced, which they sell on their website that kind of has reclaimed uh, and taps into the Chevalier's uh, past as, as, a, as a keystone, a cornerstone, really, of um, trans understanding in, in, in history. Um, ah, it's the wrong way around. Sorry, <laughs> so that's the dike deck. That's uh, the playing cards that I've just, I've just numbered them the other day. So yeah, this is an example of those. Um, uh, so sort of moving into more kind of satirical prints of this time, which sort of find um, gender transgression to be of tremendous interest and not just around the Chevalier who... Um, uh, who had even prints made of them uh, after death. Uh, so, you know, very salacious and um, uh, very horrible satirical prints. Like the one, this one uh, relates to somebody who was, um, it was called Samuel Drybutter, and they were, uh, they were lots of court records about them being um, caught um, for homosexual acts uh, in the 1770s. And they were pilloried. Um, there were many, many uh, prints that were made of them, which, sorry, you can't read the text, but he's standing with, um, with a hangman called Jack Ketch, who holds up this noose and says, uh, Dammy, Sammy, you're a pretty sweet creature, and I long to have you at the end of my string. And then uh, Samuel Drybutter replies, uh, it says, you don't love me, Jackie. Um, there were many, many similar depictions and sexual innuendo in many satirical print shops and popular press. And this is at the same time as was the very short-lived macaroni craze, um, which uh, is you know, a very short-lived scene of the 1760s and 70s, which generated also an absolutely vast amount of prints. And the husband and wife team, uh, Matthew and Mary Darley, who made uh, this one, you see their name, Darley, at the bottom of this one, uh, were some of the first to specialise in making their own prints and selling them in a print shop uh, in near Soho. And most of their prints were about satirising fashion. Between, well, in the 1770s, they produced nearly 150 different satirical 
called macaroni prints, which were extremely successful. Um, so Samuel Drybutter was repu reputed to have run the Macaroni Club, um, which is a club where they could all uh, get together, this sort of notorious club about which uh, there's lots of little tantalizing scraps of information. Um, these are a couple more of the sort of gender satire prints uh, related to the macaroni um, from as well the late uh, 18th century. It wasn't really until the 19th century that the popular press, as in newspapers and magazines, really became properly illustrated. Illustrated London News was the world's first illustrated weekly, which appeared in the 1840s. So these prints are just individual prints that you would have bought um, quite, you know, from different ranges, but a lot of them, if they were on a very cheap paper and cheaply printed, they were just a few pence, really, in, in print shops. Um, so this one is called Jack on a Cruise, a Missy in the Offing, a masquerade scene in Kensington Gardens, that's from 1775. And the one on the right is a Cornish hug in Billingsgate uh, from 18, uh, sorry, 1781. And a Cornish hug is a crushing hug designed to overpower someone. And here it's performed by a fish wife on an effeminate gentleman who's e easily overpowered by her. So these prints were not kind a lot of the time, but their audiences would have been vast and would have had, I think, a, a certain appeal and a sense of humor across the spectrum and introduced a really wide variety of different notions of gender transgression and that the idea was that it was enormously widespread. So the sort of bottom line with all the macaroni things, I think for all of the jokes and the prejudice that surrounded them in the printed press, the sheer volume of material I think that was um, generated in the world of print probably did provide access to an extended range of gender presentations beyond the binary, I think, and this subversions of the one-size-fits-all model of masculinity. Um, I just had two little prints of cruising grounds. Of course, these prints aren't intended to look like that, um, but um, this is like another way that I think we can do querying of the collections, really. So we've got probably tens of thousands of boxes of prints that look like this, uh, that very few people really come and look at or use. Um, but we did use them in a project with Ducky, uh, the Princess Project, so it was like a queer Georgians um, project, and so we were using them to look at the spaces that would have been the cruising grounds of, um, of the different times that we were looking at. Um, the Royal Exchange was identified as a so-called Molly Market, um, in one article in the London Journal, um, it describes it as not much changed its character since the swarthy bugger buggerantos used to cruise it in 1700. So there's all this information in popular press at the time about um, you know term you know different terminology for groups. And some it's really interesting to find out which words survive and which don't. Like cruising is a word that's still uh, still going. If you want to know more about this time and this particular research, do read Richter Norton's books um, about gay life in the 18th century. He's basically put a lot of them on his own website, so you can access it there. And um, this is one of Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens, which is the park on the site of the park that's behind the Royal Vauxhall Tavern uh, is today. And um, there's a huge, there's an enormous amount of literature about Vauxhall's uh, queer history. Um, and, the, you know, the, the Chevalier Dion walked in these places and things. Um, but, yes, yeah, so just sort of an idea about how we're queering 18th century topographical prints from a sense of place, really. Um, this is my pornographic slide uh, from the 1780s. Um, so in the world of literature and book illustration, these are from another kind of short-lived but very, uh, uh, you know, a moment that had an enormous, um, had an enormous impact. These are the libertine novels of Andrea de Nercia. Um, so we have uh, Felicia is uh, 1782, and this, this is called Getting Caught in the Act. Uh, the middle is from Les Aphrodites by the same writer in 1795, with this sort of strap-on scene. Uh, and Les Aphrodites is the prototypical liberty novel. It mixes a very lively narrative with a superbly written dialogue and a menagerie of picaresque characters. Engravings uh, were made of varying quality. You could get 
very high-grade um, books with these in. Again, sort of very low-grade, uh, very cheap prints. And the third one, it was another Nersia book called Le Diable au corps. Um, and the yeah, illustration is from around um, 1803. A lot of material like this was seized and held in government offices and is now sort of being um, gifted on to museums. We did have... Um, an example that was a bit similar to this that had been in a bin bag um, at uh, one government office here and it had like, fallen down behind the back of some cupboards and they gifted it to the v and and had to sign all the sort of, you know, 18th century pornography, which had been considered, you know, dangerous and a, and a moral threat to society. Um, but an amazing range um, is, is within this of all different kinds of um, gender and sexuality presentations. Um, so thinking about material that was deliberately kind of set out to shock, um, I could not include Aubrey Beardsley within, within this talk. Um, uh, he worked almost exclusively in black ink. And he worked very feverishly um, through the night. He had no formal training, which is quite incredible. Um, but letters between him and his publisher, Leonard Smithers, show that he had a really extraordinary understanding of print techniques. Um, he wrote about certain kinds of Japanese papers that didn't print um, half-tone in the way that he wanted to. Japanese paper is very thin and superior in almost every sense, but obviously not suited to half tone. Um, in a letter to uh, his patron, who was the French poet, um, Mark andre Rafalovich, um, who'd also been in the circle of Oscar Wilde and attempted to create a catalogue on everything that had ever been published on the subject of homosexuality up to that time. That book was called Les Chroniques de l'Unisexualité. So it was unisexuality, a short-lived uh, term. That was um, Beardsley wrote that the print shops of Paris are an evergreen joy to me. He was very much a big prints collector and his um, especially old master prints are quite, he did collect similar to the ones that are around the walls in this room, but particularly a big fan of Mantegna and um, old master prints which coated the walls of his studio and which you could at that time buy for quite affordable sums, um, but not now. Um, but the periodicals he re were involved with, the Yellow Book is obviously one of the most notorious ones ones um, and again sort of picking up on this masquerade idea again and I think you could probably see the you know a remnant of the macaroni in uh, this in the person on the right that character is called the Abbe Fanfreluche or Fanfreluche um, which means like frilly embellished adornments um, so that was from his only novel, which is called Under the Hill, an illustrated novel that he did. Um, and I was just going to read you a tiny little excerpt because I think the style of the prose uh, that's, that describes this character on the right just really summarizes the aesthetic and decadent style of which Beardsley was really the poster boy. So uh, they say, um, his hand slim and gracious as la marquise du défunt in the drawing by Carmontel played nervously about the gold hair that fell upon his shoulders like a finely curled peruke and from point to point of a precise toilette the fingers wandered quelling the little mutinies of cravat and ruffle so a lot of his it's all very flouncy and frilly and very much um sort of addicted to texture and materiality and, um, you know, the, his, uh, just, and I'm obsessed with Beardsley, really. There's a lot that we could say about him, but um, people always say, well, we don't really know what his sexuality was and things, but I don't think you really need to know. Um, we don't need to have bad evidence, uh, you know, about anyone or anything. Um, I just think they, his letters very much and his work um, a lot of his figures had a lot of androgyny within them, and he hid a lot of um, male genitalia throughout. I don't think there are any in this one, but if you look very hard, there might, there might be something hidden somewhere. Um, but yeah, we do have an enormous amount of them. If you've never seen them in the flesh, come to the V&A print room, because we've got boxes and boxes of them, and they're really kind of something else. Um, a similarly unique artist who maybe isn't as, as well known, born in the 1890s, but who came to sort of encapsulate the freedom and queer decadence of the interwar years in Berlin is Jeanne Mamen. And uh, she lived in the same studio apartment on Kurfürstendamm from 1919 until her death in 1976. And her building was bombed out in the Second World War, 
and she just remained there um, drawing by candlelight. And she only ever gave one interview in the year just before her death and was something of a recluse from, from 1945 on, um, but she was a hugely prolific uh, printmaker, and it, it was through her posters and illustration for books that her work really gained quite a wide audience because she didn't really play the art world game, and um, included her because she was, you know, she was at risk of really slipping into obscurity. But it was the lesbian community in Berlin who rescued a lot of her work and kept her work on the map, and there is now um, they saved her studio. Uh, this is a couple more examples of her work. Um, and you can visit it now by appointments. There's a foundation in her name. Um, and it was because of this they, they managed to have a pretty major retrospective um, of her work in 2017, which wouldn't have happened if, they, if it hadn't have been community who had, um, who had really valued this and saved it um, for the next generation. Um, so, hang on, so did, maybe had earlier. Um, so uh, I wanted to include, this is also 1920, so the same kind of time as the Jean Mermin prints, but um, I really wanted to include some examples from the Harlem Renaissance where periodicals and independent press, um, you know, similarly to the Yellow Book, these quite short-lived magazines, had an enormous impact um, in, uh, during the Harlem Renaissance in an intense period of creativity in the 1920s and 30s. And retrospectively, many gay narratives have kind of come out um, of this period or have come to light with people's later reminiscences. Um, but Richard Bruce Nugent, who did this uh, one on the left, um, was one of the few who were out and proud um, at the time. Uh, he was born in 1906 in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, this was done for a short story that was also written by Nugent called Smoke, Lilies and Jade in 1926, which was published in the first issue of a radical magazine called Fire. Um, <clears throat> In November uh, 1926, the magazine's very clear gay and bisexual content amongst many other subjects like sex work and interracial relationships and racism in segregated America was a completely unprecedented uh, magazine started by a large group of African-American artists and writers including Langston Hughes and Aaron Douglas who did the cover on the, on the right. Um, but tragically, the first issue was the last as the headquarters of Fire magazine were burned to the ground because people had been so upset about the controversial content and it never recovered. Um, but original copies of it are one of the great rarities in the world, but Nugent had saved a pristine copy uh, for nearly 60 years. And um, uh, this book fanatic called Tom Worth learned that this original copy existed and uh, started the Fire Press in 1982. So they created a replica edition of it, which is available, you can buy it now, for a very reasonable $7.50. Um, so it's incredibly ahead of its time, Fire magazine, but a great uh, story of print revival and community connections and the importance of archiving um, to be able to you know, really have access to this kind of stuff. Um, Sydney Hunt, who I use as my cover pick, uh, a little excerpt from this, um, is yeah another artist mainly working in the 20s and 30s and made another short-lived magazine that was called Ray. Um, I found him looking through a box, uh, well, these big albums of book plates that we have um, in the V&A, and uh, it was one. It's not this one, but it was a similar similar ones um, that I just sort of saw and I thought, hello, you know, this is a, I found, I found a, a queer artist here. Um, and uh, yeah, he was a, a mainly working in sort of vorticist influence. There's a real hotbed at this time of quite short-lived artist groups um, and again, short-lived artist magazines. So his magazine only lasted for two issues. Um, the, much the same as Blast, which was a magazine by Wyndham Lewis, which also just ran for two issues, but people have written endless amount of books about that, but very few people have really written about Sidney Hunt and Ray. Uh, there's only a couple of physical copies. There's one at Oxford Uni and one at Cambridge. Um, and I think you know, maybe he would have been pleased with the caliber of library that he uh, is still in. But I think a lot of he fell out of knowledge because he sadly lost his life and a lot of his work um, in the London Blitz, his house and studio um, were, were destroyed. Um, so, but there's been, a, 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 again, through sort of print collectors, his work has sort of come, um, 
come back to light. And again, he was another person who was out of the closet um, in a time when there was a big sort of risk of doing that um, and remembered as primarily as a book plate artist, if anyone could be remembered as such a, a niche thing. But um, it's, it's sort of become a thriving field again. There's lots of graphic novelists are re, you know, reinvigorating the book plate. Um, so, you know, it's an exciting time for that. But um, Sydney Hunt, yeah, there's, again, I think there is one digitised copy of Ray. So, so do check it out. He did, he did make a, a big impact in his moment. Um, Hockney is someone who, of course, you know, was difficult to, to not include. Um, I just wanted to, you know, some of them we're all quite familiar with, but this is uh, from a series of illustrations which accompanied um, 14 poems by the Egyptian-born Greek poet uh, Constantine Peter Kavafi. It came out in 1925. So in 1966, uh, Hockney did this homage, series of etchings um, that reprint the poetry. Um, and he stole the original book of poems from Bradford Library, uh, and he talked about it on BBC Radio 4. He said, I found Cavafy in the library in 1960, but you had to ask for it. I looked it up in the index, but it wasn't on the shelf because um, they were worried about too many people reading these poems, but I got it, and I never took it back. Um, you couldn't buy this book in England at the time, and of course the poems were wonderful. So there's this sort of, you know, library theft it put me in mind of Joe Wharton a little bit there as well. Um, but yeah, they're a very exquisite uh, suite of prints. If you haven't seen all of them, again, you can come see them at the v and print room. Um, uh, Hockney famously did a rake's progress, um, uh, and so did these two artists, Lubain Himid and Yinka Shonibari did. Uh, versions of Rake's Progress as well. I think Yinka did the queerest one uh, as a large-scale photographic work, so I'm not including that as its photographs, uh, but they, these are very new. These are all from 2022, um, I think, yeah. Uh, these two on the right are from a revamped school print series. The school prints was started in the 40s, uh, in the sort of post-war period to show... Uh, this sort of nostalgia and put, um, I think, put quality art into the classroom. So they had a, a very brief remit was that they asked artists to make something suitable for children, not use more than six colors. And they would be an auto -lithograph lithography, basically. Um, so they revamped this in Yorkshire in uh, 2018 by the Yorkshire, by the he Hepworth Wakefield. And they had exactly the same remit and they commissioned 19 artists over four years to make lithographic prints with school children from the Yorkshire area. So some very lucky kids in 2022 got to work with Dubaina Himid and Yenka Shonibari to do um, a suite of prints that were about uh, decolonization and teaching of black history uh, more widely across the curriculum. This one is a, a reprint, well, so it was um, made for um, the 75 years anniversary of the ICA existing, but it was a show which Lubain Himid curated in 1985 um, that was all black women artists. It was called the Thin Black Line Exhibition. And she said in 2022, when they made this poster to go um, as a, you know, a, a memento of that, um, she said... This shows you know, how much has really changed in the last 30 years, I suppose, since that show was on. But some people said I was a cultural terrorist because I made this exhibition in 1985. Other people warned me that the ICA would never show the work of black women artists again once this show was over. The print I decided to design to celebrate 75 years of the ICA is a letter to the doubters to remind everyone that the exhibition is important now and was important then. And there's, um, yes, Lubaina Hamid, there's a great, very, very long interview with her um, at the British Library, which you can listen to or read as a transcript, where she talks about working with um, lots of the women in this, particularly Maud Salter and Ingrid Pollard and the kind of black lesbian art scene. Um, of the 80s and Joy Gregory's just done a brilliant new book about about that as well um, so we're going to talk very briefly about Fierce Pussy how are we doing time slightly all right I, I'll speed it up slightly uh, but because uh, we're going to talk about Fierce Pussy in the chat I know but it's deliberately lowercase to be non-hierarchical and another thing that I just have discovered in the V&A the, the, these ones on the left were uncatalogued um, group of posters that we got in the mid 90s and there's like a bit of a there was always a bit of a problem 
when they switched away from paper files to computers, the things that they got in the couple of years when they did that, some of them kind of slipped, uh, slipped off the system, basically. But back to fixed it pretty much now, and I uh, was very, very happy to get these on. Um, if you can't read the, the so, yeah, well, uh, the, they were sort of very deliberately lo-fi in their practice. They were mainly using Xerox and typewriters and flea market photographs. Um, but it was all about getting the message out onto the street um, really fast. Um, there were four original core members of this New York-based um, group um, who described themselves as a queer art collective. And they did use the word dyke quite a lot. And they you know, did do a lot of stuff. They were involved in Dyke March and things. Um, they were involved all with ACT UP um, before they set up Fierce Pussy as a, a more lesbian-focused um, group. Um, but they are, um, they're back, they're very active. They just did something at Leslie Lohman a couple of years ago um, and uh, continued to do a lot of activism, things about HIV and AIDS. But I loved this. Uh, they would do print these posters and then drive them around New York, um, <coughs> stuck to the side of trucks. Um, so it's a, you know, a great way to do visual activism with prints um, that sort of just goes beyond flyering or you know, flight posting. Um, so, you know, ACT UP and Grand Fury, of course, don't need a huge um, preamble, but they very similar style with uh, Xeroxing. Um, and I wanted to include this. This is a very rare one. I haven't really seen many collections that have this one, but of course he uses the Robert Indiana Love um, pop art um, thing, which has been massively made into hundreds of uh, sculptures, which are, is public art all over the world, but many different iterations. But I think this is a, a great one for Riot by Graham Fury, who, of course, was a um, visual arts wing of, of ACT UP. And this is another part of... Um, these were made for the AIDS Memorial. Jenny Holzer, very uh, key artist who's been much, much imitated um, since doing mainly text-based Base work um, since the 70s. Um, these were made uh, in a collaboration with the New York City AIDS Memorial. Um, and I sort of put it in for sort of thinking about print on different kind, not just on paper. You know, there's a whole world of getting print and topography-based art out there. And they use some of her signature phrases like protect me from what I want, but also excerpts from Walt Whitman's poem, um, The Song of Myself. So it's another sort of queer connection. Um, thinking about printing on different kinds of materials. Um, if you've never been on the Visual Aids uh, archive, I strongly uh, recommend you to do this. It's a unique uh, resource um, which was in, came about in 1988, um, and to, to quote their own uh, aim, is to utilize art to fight AIDS by provoking dialogue, supporting HIV artists, and um, preserving a legacy because AIDS is not over. Um, but these three I thought were very interesting. Um, the rainbow is a uh, silk screen printed onto gut um, skin. Uh, the middle one is a fingerprint uh, portrait. So it's, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, thinking about the, the enormous range of what you can do, very lo-fi and uh, very fancy. And on the right is a uh, kissing couple is a Xerox on latex. Um, to referencing condoms called Safe from 1993. Um, and uh, just and one other artist that I recently discovered as I was putting this talk together indeed, this is Marc Pelletier, who's from Maine. Um, and these are two etchings uh, also from 1989. Um, but this is a, I thought it was a great example of an etching where you don't actually have to make a lot of marks on the plate all of that gradation of texture and tone is done through the way that you ink the plate and the way that you remove the ink. So, you know, there's a, an enormous amount of variety, tonal variety that can be done with it. And I just thought these were fantastic examples. Um, yeah, Keith Haring, very quickly. Again, yeah, very prolific, unbelievably prolific artist who created more than 3,000 works on paper and approximately 300 paintings. Um, and... Uh, I wish I'd seen a 2007 show the Keith Herring Foundation did in the Czech Republic where um, they put Herring's work together with Egon Schiele um, and the Herring Foundation had said that both were um, sexually compulsive and condemned in their lifetimes for their depictions of explicit sexuality and its transformative energy 
um, achieving aesthetic maturation when barely post-adolescent um, was what the Keith Herring Foundation say about his work. And he really experimented with lithography and silkscreen etching, woodcuts, embossing, and he partnered with so many different publishers all around the world um, in order to get his work out. But yeah, these are two untitled lithographs from 1983, um, and he deliberately untitled most of his work so that you could have your own interpretation. Um, and the last one I'm going to talk about in this kind of section, uh, who I wanted to ha have in really for um, the extraordinary range of how Felix Gonzalez Torres incorporated print into his sculptural work. Um, so this is newsprint in a bottle with a work uh, called Untested in 1987. And he was very concerned with all kinds of facets of inequality and economic corruption and poverty. And he did many different kinds of original installations um, that defy categorization. But this poster, lithographic poster on the right is called Untitled Death by Gun uh, 1990, which was exhibited at MoMA as a stack of papers on the ground. And gallery visitors were not sure if they were supposed to pick them up, because a lot of his installations um, sort of invite you to pick, pick one up. Um, but the idea is, is that the, the stack stays uh, nine inches high, um, and uh, that it will be sort of continually reprinted and replaced by MoMA, where it exists. So they just keep on printing them and keep the stack at uh, the height that he requested. Um, but it uh, lists on the sheet the names of 460 individuals killed in just one week in, uh, by gun in May 1989. And it gives their name and age and city and state. And um, it's a, one of the most arresting um, pieces of activist art I've, I've ever seen. Um, so talking about, I'm sure maybe some of you thought that the whole talk would be more about zines and um, this kind of uh, this kind of material. These are four zines that I got from the Digital Transgender Archive. Um, and yeah, whole talk could have been done just about um, this kind of cheaper small press stuff. Um, a lot of sources say that the first zine was made in the USA in 1930, and it's called The Comet, uh, and that the early zines were about sci-fi and things. But I think, you know, the example that we saw at the beginning from 1620, in some ways, is a precursor of a zine. And there's lots of different kinds of cheaply made, small printed uh, things, which I think you could you could uh, say it goes way, way back before 1930. But the first queer zine is usually given as one called Vice Versa, of which there were nine copies made in um, 1947 by a woman called Lisa Ben, which is an anagram of lesbian. And uh, she hand typed it. Uh, and uh, I think that I don't know where there are copies of that, but I think there are some. In, there must be some in public uh, collections. But yeah, these are all mainly from when it mainly got going, much more in the sort of 80s and 90s, and a unique lifeline, you know, for people to find their community. Zines are very fondly remembered um, by people who grew up in the pre-internet time as like a way that that's how they found their scene and their friends. Um, there's also, I recommend the Queer Zine Library, which is a mobile DIY library, and they have digitized or uh, well, they have 900 queer zine titles, and there many of which have been digitized. So I'd say that's your one-stop shop. Uh, go to the queer zine library. Um, so I'm just going to race through a couple of contemporary artists who've sort of made a significant contribution um, to print. Grayson, of course, probably Britain's most famous artist, almost like tipping over into people, uh, you know, it's, I, th I think a lot of the television uh, stuff is when you get a little bit too popular, then people sort of love to hate you a bit. But um, with this um, print, I think it's a fantastic self-portrait in their home or in their studio. And in it, they say, uh, this self-portrait is a fantasy version of myself, neither fully male nor fully female, um, which is entering non-binary territory. But Grayson has also said that they're very afraid by the word identity and they're always worried that they're going to get told off about it because you know being a, being a transvestite is certainly still 
left out a little bit or it has its own taboos and complexities which um, I still don't think we have, you know, really broached uh, very much as a community. Um, but uh, the, these are uh, works by Didier William, who is an artist I discovered last year in Philadelphia. Um, he's a Haitian-American artist um, who we, I got to visit his studio, and he made this uh, incredible suite of posters, which just sort of shows you a detail. It gives you that um, uh, fantastic detail of the half tone there on the, on the, on the plate on the stone, I think it's like, yeah, this really also has the impression of looking at a lithographic stone, but this is the finished um, plate. Um, but yeah, I've got a couple more uh, examples of his, they're really quite large scale uh, prints. Uh, he uses the eye a lot as adornment and voyeurism, talking about voyeurism of the black body. Um, but he was, yeah, a very interesting um, artist to speak to, lots of his, uh, bodies are quite androgynous and tumbling through space and there are quite a lot of underwater themes. Um, but yeah, he's um, he's just done a lot of really great talks recently. So yeah, look him up as sort of talking about being a black queer artist and working in print um, as someone I uh, was very excited to discover. And the last person I'm going to talk about is uh, Micheline Thomas because... Um, yeah, it's just been doing, if you, yeah, you need to see the work in the flesh as well to get the complexity of it. Um, but these are very, very detailed prints which have many, many, many layers um, to them. I saw some of them being printed or being the blocks being put together at the Durham Press uh, in Pennsylvania last year. And some of them have like 40 layers of color built up um, and this one is a mixed media collage incorporating woodblock, silkscreen, and digital printing. It's called Sleep de Femme Noire, and it's uh, from 2013. Um, and when asked in an interview with Them Us magazine recently, as a black queer artist, how do you approach your practice? Um, and she said, uh, mainly I'm inspired by my personal life, and by my personal narrative and current events. I take those elements that inspire me and try to decipher them in ways that would make sense by thinking about the mediums and the tools that I employ. And so, yeah, the, the amount of tools and the richness of the world of tools in printmaking is um, something that really you have to visit studios and get in there to, to really behold that. Um, but uh, I think she's very interesting for some good mashups of technique as well. She incorporates very, very multiple techniques um, to get these extraordinarily lush and detailed works. Um, so the one on the left is a screen print, woodblock, digital print, and flocking as well. So it has a kind of um, velvety flock texture also added to it. And the one on the right is simply a digital print. Um, and she says, there are not enough images of black women loving black women specifically. So I feel I have a responsibility to co contribute positive images for those who don't know where else to go. And I think this kind of sentiment really sums up in a nutshell the things that we're considering this evening in terms of printmaking for change, the power of art, um, to really make a difference um, out there in the world and put people on the map and uh, forge greater understanding. I think Mickey and Thomas's work um, really breathes new life into some old genres or classic genres like the nude, for instance, and mixing traditional print techniques alongside digital, so using something like flocking for a wallpaper and incorporating it into fine art practice, I think is just a great example of the complexity and diversity of print um, and its intensely creative, collaborative, limitless world. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I haven't gone slut too far over. Uh, but yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Zorian. It was wonderful. I love uh, Lisa Ben as an artist pseudonym. <laughs> I always think it's funny, too, how there's, there's this debate over the first zine. Yeah. Being sort of like, is it, you know, is it the 1930s? Is it, um, but, you know, as we can see, it's sort of something that takes on that distribution in the, in, in the public form. It's obviously not just a modern phenomenon. 
No, and everybody loves these, like, oh, it was the first, th and then mistakes just all, you know, I think a lot of internet stuff is really lazy, and then it just repeat, 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 like something, um, you know, but there's a lot more digging to be done, and there's so much already that we don't know or that we don't have access to, because digitization of collections is really only a drop in the ocean of what is actually there. Um, so, you know, there's new discoveries to be made all, all the time. I think that should be an exciting thing. Yeah. I was um, particularly interested in uh, what you're learning about um, queer communities from the 1600s, 1700s, actually through pamphlets that might have actually been distributed um, with sort of cruel intents. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and like court records, um, what they called the Society for the Reformation of Manners, I think they were called. They were like before the police. They were this group that were particularly obsessed about homosexuality and started up their own police um, in the 18th century that was just going around looking for this. But then all of the court records that then you get from around that time um, are extremely detailed and you can build up a picture of where people are going. And uh, again, on the Richter Norton website, there's really great, uh, really, really long um, detailed things where he's like copied out enormous amounts of the court records, but mapped them as well. Um, so you can almost like take a walk around London yeah, reading it. The geography, and, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So um, I do want to bring it out to the room really fast, but before we do that, um, I did want to ask you one question, um, especially thinking about materiality, because um, the last lecture in the series was um, was about mesotint and thinking about the process of mesotint as being quite um, uh, laborious, also taking quite a bit of time using materials such yeah. as copper to etch. Um, and I thought a good place to start as I was thinking about um, the artist in your presentation today was thinking about Fierce Pussy, um, which also relates to um, you know, some other aspects of uh, sort of communal practice. And um, I love what you said before too about there's always a cheaper way to do it, yeah. which is a very <laughs> like printmaking um, thing to think about. So, um, so I was reading an article by Lauren Butler uh, uh, it was published in Art Forum 2019, um, and she pointed out that uh, among the founding members of Fierce Pussy, including Zoe Leonard in 1991, um, that several of them were working within de magazine departments for GQ, Traveler Magazine, um, and during these sort of uh, low tide moments of the day, they were sort of using the copiers in the office to produce their artwork which they were um, sort of putting on billboards around bathrooms um, in New York City. Um, and also the, this strange irony that maybe NBC or Microsoft or some of these major corporations were contributing financially to this kind of like liberation movement. Um, so I'm just thinking about sort of materials and value and thinking about the urgency of the work and how that differs from thinking about a fine art print uh, historically and traditionally, um, you know, what it might say about, yeah, the urgency of a message or activism. Um, yeah, so I just thought that was a good starting off point. Yeah, in the 70s in London, there were a huge amount of screen printing workshops that were very open, community access, and because people couldn't make flyers for queer nights or whatever, or go, you know, just from your, uh, they would be barred from making that kind of thing in regular copy shops and stuff. So things like Sea Red Women's Workshop and um, Paddington Print Shop and the Lenthal Road Press, um, which Ingrid Pollard and uh, Lubaina Himid worked at quite a bit. Oh, wow. Um, there's a great film of that as well on the BFI free player that you can watch of the, the Lenthal Road Press. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of interesting in just a decade, 
you know, going from screen printing and much more kind of labor intensive techniques, but ones where they were sort of almost free, um, free access and that you could go down there and learn how to do printmaking. Um, and there was more of that kind of skill sharing, but loads of that was activist printmaking, mainly, yeah, the, um, C Red did some lesbian posters and lots of feminist uh, posters. Um, but yeah, then to go into the 90s, the, the urgency, particularly the AIDS crisis, like even just going and faffing around cleaning your screens and stuff is like, that's too too long. For sure. You know, so all of the, the yeah, the Xerox machine and it really came into it. And Rizo, I suppose, right. people using this kind of, you said Rizo, I always said Rizo. I think, be, I always yeah. think, well, it's a Japanese company, <laughs> okay. so it's probably called Yeah, you're Rizo, probably right. But I think I've people just been say saying it wrong <laughs> always, yeah. But yeah, all these kinds of methods, um, you know, really came to their own and were, but there's a lot of print makers in the pop era who were using Xerox, um, as well. To uh, create half tone or uh, it has a specific graphic quality. To yeah. Use. Um, yeah. and yeah, just sort of ex- experimenting and stuff. They were still quite, there were precursors to it called my mimeographs or mimographs, whatever, yeah. but Xerox machines weren't really that, it was still quite a f- fancy office when it had one. Right, right. So yeah, you know. I think, I think the technology <clears throat> of a mimeograph is eventually what a Rizzo printer is sort yeah. of trying to mimic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, used for sort of cheaper newspaper runs and... Yeah, and Fierce Pussy, their recent show is mainly, I mean, it did show a lot of their older, cheaper posters, but I think they mainly just kind of work in the same way now. Right, And right. so it's that's kind of cool as yeah. well, because it's like yeah. the, the same urgency of their act- activism is, isn't there, but that's now their aesthetic, you know? Yeah. So it Actually, in reading it. about one of their uh, more recent shows today, there was a mention of... Um, the sense that you know there's a crisis that's still ongoing so yeah. even in thinking about their response to the AIDS crisis that um, it's still ongoing and also that I'm thinking about the matrix that you would need to create for a print and then when you're working in digital formats it's not so much materially it doesn't so materially exist in time and is a bit more ephemeral in that way which um, which I think can allow an artwork to continue to to be produced and reproduced, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not as firmly historic. So I don't know if that makes sense. But um, does anybody in the room have any questions for Zorian or comments? Don't worry if you don't. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> It's not on. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I had two very different questions, but I think I'll ask the first one because it's um, first one first. Um, I was curious when you were showing your the 18th century prints, and um, there seemed to be a lot of conversation between Britain and France, um, whether it's the Liberty novels or sort of via uh, Aubrey Beardsley's um, patron and, and so on. So I was just curious about what those uh, relationships were and whether France has, you know, was it ahead? What are the conversations happening via these national borders? And is it percolating? Is it, or is it often quite separate? I think there's, yeah, a huge amount of cultural exchange there because France was much more free and easy in many regards around uh, publishing and publishing of sexier material, let's say. But also... Yeah, there were an enormous amount of very accessible brothels and things like that, which were very open, which was was not the case here. So there was a lot of um, a lot of diaries and letters and things of people who were specifically going there, but also um, yeah, Beardsley went to France again and again, like you know, partly to visit bookshops and print shops and things, but just you know, that the closest place that you could go that was you know so revered and celebrated its culture as you know paris and so yeah so much rich history within within just this one city um yeah re- relating to to that and how you know easily accessible it was i suppose and when you compare legally how much further behind in some ways we were especially around yeah, sexuality what, yeah. um you know visiting paris was your 
would have been a, a great, uh, you know, a great experience for people, especially LGBTQ people. You know. Yeah, and you see that sort of in the style of the Liberty novels too, as well, like the plates. And it's interesting that like book the previous two books being thought of as a sort of artistic uh, expressive media there's there's still the source for expressive um what sort of expressive acts or for artists to interpret yeah yeah and then yeah lots of you know obviously like ladies of the left bank and those kind of hubs then grow around cities that have a more kind of permissive uh, sense about them um but yeah, yeah. and then there's much more, much easier to research as well, and people sort of get together and make things together. Then it just right. kind of is much more evocative as well to think about. Instead of like Chevalier Dion, we think of queer people sort of that far back in history, just floating in a sea of time with no community, and they're sort of presented as very alone, I think. And then, you know, yeah, as mm. century progresses, we have these much more lively urban hubs where people are obviously finding each other and um, so yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> Did you have a second question? I could ask the second question, <laughs> but I don't want to well. um, also monopolize. <laughs> if there's any, anyone else, do you want? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm just really interested to know how you um, decide that an image is to be read as a queer image, you know, when is an image of a gay, uh, sorry, not a gay man, of a naked man, you know, surely there's some of them are just images of naked men. Sure, and, yeah. and is it that you need to, is it about the context in which it's shown, which, and presumably knowing some biograph, biographical details of the maker, and also likewise with women, I mean, surely we don't read every naked woman, I mean, like which is Western, you know, art canon is, you know, packed, yeah. we can't see all of those as, as yeah. queer images. Well, there was something... Um, That's a good question. Yeah, there was something Lubaina Himid said about uh, Aura Knight paintings. She loved, she went down to St. Ives and she was looking into the people who'd gone before in St. Ives. And she was really, she described Laura Knight's paintings as lesbian erotica, of these like women who are sitting on the cliffs, like, you know, it's all very romantic and things. And I, I don't think Laura Knight was queer, but like there's a free, you know, we are moved into a time when it's kind of, people are much more freely open, like it's a more, you know, t to just crush heteronormativity and feel more, you know, free about claiming things or, you know, seeing something within it, whether or not you ever find out that there was something. But I think particularly with the male nudes that I've... Because uh, we have different terms within our cataloging system. So camp is quite newly put in. Camp was one that was put in... Uh, uh, and homoerotic, I suppose, but then, yeah, not every picture of a... Of a but uh, there's, like, Frederick Lathan, who was a very uh, prominent 19th century artist. I think his, he possibly was a gay man. He was a bachelor for life and uh, had... There's some letters that exist. But there's just something about the way that there's so much more detail and love has gone into the sculpting of the buttocks and thighs of these guys you can feel it you know uh, like with the sydney hunt things like yeah you know yeah it's just a figure but there's something within it that i think you do read uh, through time i think their intention is in there um and i think you get it when queer photographers or whatever are behind the lens and they're photographing a queer person and you just you know like the difference between maybe a diane arbus photograph of a trans person and then I don't know uh Catherine Opie photograph of a lesbian like you can feel the difference there um and yeah and there's something kind of magical about it but I I've sort of I'm was a bisexual and then I was a lesbian and I came out as trans and then I've been a gay man so I kind of feel I've got quite a broad sweep when I'm looking at things uh, how I personally sort of go about looking at things in the museum to um, queer them, you know. But then if... I'll usually write a little text to explain why I've done it if it's not really obvious, you know. So people don't say there is no, there's no queer narrative here. You know, but who says? 
how do we know? So. <laughs> um, before um, my second question, we have a question from the online audience. Um, so if I can read it out um, and you can speak to it. So it's asking, could Zorian speak more to how these LGBTQIA plus narratives can be hidden in collections? And uh, the process, and about the process of unearthing them, how easy are these stories to unearth, especially when not collected to celebrate this community? In many instances, a little bit of what you were saying already. Yeah, there was a box that was called uh, Life Studies or something, um, and a colleague of mine discovered it, and inside it was all like 1950s physique photography of muscle guys in little posing pouches by plinths and stuff like pure pictorial kind of stuff but yeah they just so they'd acquired it i think in 1948 um uh, which is pretty early for the physique genre as well but i didn't know if they just sort of hidden you know hidden it in by saying oh it's just a box of life studies you know but then because they weren't really explicitly explained what they were they just sat in the box um unlooked at until sort of about 10 years ago or something so i think that definitely happens and there's other instances that i found with tra with a trans artist uh, that they acquired something by in the 1930s I guess the curator didn't know what to do about the this name that they knew that they had a female name before and then they have a male name. So they just put the surname and then the surname was spelled wrongly in that case as well. This is Anton Prina, but it had been put as Primer because their signature kind of looks like Primer. So they just put Primer and, you know, uh, it was like nearly 100 years until you realize but i think it's not less necessary done like with malice necessarily or that we would know but i definitely think things that have existed people didn't you know people might have got them in there i we know that three of the directors of the vna through the 20th century were gay men um from the 30s to the 60s so you know but people then didn't really have to justify everything in the way that they did now they just you could just get it and basically pop a number on it and put it in the cupboard. And I can't do that now, unfortunately. I have to go through a lot of procedure. But thankfully now, the institutions are clamoring to make up for the fact that they have a huge gap. And I think that's audiences are driving that and saying, actually, hang on, where are your trans artists? Where are your artists of color? And why don't you have, why don't you have more of them? And there isn't a good answer for that, except that they just never really you, they just never focused on it, you know, <laughs> and there's no other way of saying that, you know. Um, but it's good, it's better late than never, is what I say. So we've got some money at the moment, we've got 30 grand from the Art Fund to improve the representation of trans and non-binary artists. So we've been doing that for the last two years and giving people lots of lovely money to actually buy their work and not just have it as gifts as well, because... That's a problem as well. We're, all museums are basically living on gifts, and that's not appropriate to be growing the collection in various ways yeah. like that. So, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I divert, I digress to them. Yeah. Did we have another question from you, Shia? Um No, I think, I mean, rather than sort of sitting here and asking you more questions, we could break out into the reception and so then people yeah. can talk more informally and we can continue our conversations, really. Great. Yeah. Thank you all so much for fun. coming. Really Thank lovely. You all. Thank you, Zoyan.